by Americans for Prosperity to assist them in, in putting on this event this evening. It really is their event. And I'm going to hand, hand the mic over to Jesse Smith, who is a regional <coughs> friend of ours from Americans for Prosperity, and he'll take it from you. That's something we're going to change, and it's because of uh, folks like you that show out to our events that you know are really encouraged to come out and hear what we're going to be doing. Um, and another reason that's going to change is because of our leadership at the state level. And with that, I'd like to introduce the Ohio State Director, Eli Miller. Thank you for your generosity. Um, we, all, we always have a lot of goodies. 
And I, I tell folks, if you come to the CDR meeting, you get cake and cookies and pizza. If you go to a Democratic organization, you get tofu and a video about the eagles of butter. By Michelle Obama. Uh, also, I want to point out, uh, I think Dave Frost and Ben Goldstein are somewhere in the back of the room with petitions. They are CDR members who have been championing uh, the challenge to the Northeast Ohio Sustainable Communities Initiative. Uh, they, they are hosting a forum in Independence on September 11th. You're going to hear more about that from us in the coming weeks. And we uh, want to encourage people from whatever side of the aisle you're on uh, to go to those meetings because this is about your property rights and local control of your community. Uh, I do want to mention briefly too, uh, you know, we had our ice cream social a couple weeks ago for Wounded Warrior. Thank you for the more than 50 people who helped put that on. Uh, we had more than 350 people attend. Uh, thanks to your generosity, our treasurer, Steve. Uh, Swedish was able to write a check for about $1,900 to Wounded Warrior. So thank you all. <laughs> and again, thank you to, to Eli and Jesse and Americans for Prosperity. We have uh, worked with Americans for Prosperity in the past. They are a wonderful organization. They are a consistent voice for conservative fiscal values. And uh, I see actually one of our young younger members and someone who goes back to the very first Bush campaign, Joe Aquilino, who many of you may remember. Always the handsomest guy in the room. Right? So, you know, our motto is make your voice heard. Um, again, our, order, our members have to vote on and decide on every important matter. We are not a rubber stamp for the GOP or anyone, as I'm sure the GOP establishment will tell you. Um, so it is very fitting that we're here tonight uh, so that all of us can participate in our democracy. That's the most important way that we can protect our freedoms. And when we are privileged to participate in an event like this, we do so because we want to help the public, taxpayers, voters, be able to hear directly from important elected public officials and have questions and dialogue with them. And I, and I understand Josh is going to, you will be able to take some questions tonight, Josh. I, uh, I mentioned that only because I do ask this. We, we always, our members probably sit here hearing me say this, we only ask that Ask whatever you want. We don't filter questions. Uh, but remember, uh, when someone is up here speaking, please treat them as a guest in your home. And please also, if you want to make a comment or a statement, do so. But please be brief and please be brief and to the point with your questions. Not only so that, uh, in this case, our state treasurer can, can give a direct, meaningful answer, but also out of consideration for, for your fellow voters and other people in the audience so there's ample opportunity for more people to ask questions. Uh, and now, uh, it is a privilege for me to introduce Josh. I would like to say just a few words about him. He's, he's a young man who I've been privileged to know um, since before he became state, a state representative uh, by way of his mom and dad uh, when he was a young Marine serving in Iraq. He is a patriot in every sense of the word, a Marine, and I'm told you never say former Marine, once a Marine, always a Marine, who served two tours of duty in Iraq. Um, he is uniquely qualified to speak, I think, about fiscal responsibility because he has served uh, first as, I think, probably the youngest Lindner City Councilman, is that right? So he has seen fiscal matters from the standpoint of the city. He has seen fiscal matters as a state representative. Uh, so he knows this from, from the standpoint of the legislature and now from the executive branch uh, as the state treasurer. He has always been a forceful advocate of taxpayers' rights and fiscal responsibility. And he, in my experience, has always been a champion of conservative values. And we're privileged to have him here tonight. Josh. All right, good evening. Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, rather than uh, speaking at you, what I thought I'd do is just speak real briefly and then take as many questions uh, as I can. I know this was uh, uh, built as a town hall meeting to talk about public policy issues, so I'm going to try to take as many questions uh, as I can. Before I do that, uh, looking out here at a
few hundred of my 11.5 main bosses. I wanted to give you a quick report on uh, how things are going uh, in Columbus at the State House. Uh, when I came in there as state treasurer, uh, when Governor Casey came in there, uh, there was an $8 million uh, hole in our state budget. Uh, as I stand here today, uh, we've taken that $8, $8 million hole and turned it into a surplus. Uh, we've taken a rainy day fund that's gone from $0.89 cents, uh, to now uh, over a $1 billion. For the first time in over uh, a decade, we've heard an, uh, an upgrade in the bond rating to the Ohio Enterprise Bond Fund, and while 14 states and local governments were downgraded in their credit rating, uh, we earned a AAA credit rating on the multi-billion dollar investment fund I manage. Uh, so uh, I believe we are walking the walk, and uh, I'm doing everything I can as a fiscal conservative uh, to, uh, to lead by example. Leading by example means sometimes uh, you're up uh, against uh, people in your own uh, party, and uh, other times you're up against people in the other party, and other times you're up against folks in the media. Uh, what I've uh, found is that it's important to stand on what you believe in and stand on principle, regardless of who you might be agreeing with or disagreeing with. And uh, you know, this function tonight is a completely nonpartisan uh, function, and uh, I try to uh, lead to the best of my ability uh, as the CFO of the state of Ohio in a way that disregards political affiliation and that just does, does what's best uh, for the state of Ohio. It's one of the reasons why I, I was at the tip of the spear to eliminate the death tax here in the state of Ohio. Uh, I felt the death tax was a form of double taxation. Uh, I felt it was one of the reasons why uh, people were moving and making uh, Naples and Palm Beach second capitals of Ohio. Uh, I felt it was, uh, there was something more they wrong, just didn't feel right about local government's budgeting based on people dying. Uh, and on top of that, as we know, uh, if you want uh, less of something, tax it. Uh, and what was happening was we were taxing people and we were losing uh, intelligent, hardworking Ohioans who for six months in a day started spending time in Florida or some other state, but then six months in a day turned into seven months, turned into eight months, and all of a sudden these parents and grandparents were spending most of the year away from their kids living here in the Cleveland area or somewhere else. And I'm hopeful that by uh, eliminating the uh, death tax we'll be able to, in part, reverse that exodus of, uh, of people and uh, intellectual and financial capital from our state. Uh, that being said, I think the income tax is a greater problem than the uh, death tax. I applaud the legislature for lowering the income tax. My hope is, though, that we can continue to lower it and lower it uh, to the point where eventually uh, we'll be one of those states in America that doesn't have a state income tax. Um, one of the areas uh, of uh, importance, I believe, in holding politician, politicians and bureaucrats accountable for how they spend, spend money is transparency. Uh, Justice Brandeis once said that the greatest disinfect, disinfectant to government waste is, uh, is something. When you shine that sunlight on government spending, uh, it exposes people who might be wasting our tax money or defrauding us as taxpayers. And so when I first came in as a state treasurer, I announced something and did something that was relatively controversial. Uh, I took the uh, salary uh, data for state employees throughout the state and I put them up on the internet for everyone to see. Uh, state property database, uh, all the thousands of properties throughout the state of Ohio, I took those and put them up on my website for everyone to see. And I think uh, that exposure and publicity for that was one of the reasons why the state legislature in this uh, uh, most recent uh, budget process created a task force to examine all these state properties and ask the question, if there's a property that's not being used or that's underused, why is the government still own it? Wouldn't there be a better purpose for the public if a private sector, small business, or someone else actually uh, was utilizing uh, that property? And I'm hopeful in the next year or two, uh, through identifying a lot of these underutilized and unused properties, we'll be able to sell them or lease them to, uh, to the private sector. The uh, next step in my transparency initiative is one that's ruffled a lot of feathers. Uh, I announced this, and I'm working on it in concert with Mike DeVille, who's a state representative from, from Berea. This is House Bill 175, and uh, this legislation will take the state's checkbook and put it on the internet. Yeah. I believe by virtue of knowing that people throughout the state of Ohio will be watching how they spend 
spend money, they being public officials, whether they're folks who work in the bowels of the bureaucracy or folks who are elected leaders. When these elected leaders and public officials know that we, the people, are watching, you better believe they're going to think twice before they defraud the taxpayers or they waste tax money. Uh, as you might imagine, uh, in the bowels of the bureaucracy, there are people who are trying to throw marbles under my feet, who aren't really happy about this initiative, who don't want all this information on the internet. Uh, and we're going to stay vigilant and get this done. Uh, one of my asks for you tonight is when you have time to go on the Ohio House and Ohio Senate website and communicate with your state representatives and state senators asking them to uh, support House Bill 175 because I think it will be a great public service uh, for citizens throughout the state. I stood at this press conference when we were announcing it and on one side of me we had a guy from the Buckeye Institute which is a conservative think tank uh, in Columbus and on the other side of me we had a lady from Ohio Perg, Ohio Public, Inter in public Interest Research Group which is, which is a left wing organization. These folks stand, don't stand shoulder to shoulder too often. Uh, but the, the, the mission of transparency is one of those uh, missions that I believe can bring together people across the uh, political spectrum. It's really a, a nonpartisan issue. We've been able to accomplish all of this uh, by responsible budgeting, by intelligent, thoughtful decision making, uh, and also by putting in place a qualified set of workers. Um, I've looked uh, within government, but really more so within the private sector, to find the best and brightest talented men and women as possible in my office. And we've taken this office in the Treasury Office from 140 budgeted positions when I first came in there down to 114 actual people working there now. So we've shrunk the size of the office, but while shrinking it, we've injected talents into the office. We've cleaned up the corruption in the office, and we've put in this office a set of talented people who are making the right decisions. It's one of the reasons why we've been able to cut our budget three years in a row. It's one of the reasons why we've become a national leader in respect to transparency. And it's one of the reasons why we've been able to earn these high ratings on our bonds and our investments because we have talent in the office. Uh, and uh, I'm proud of the team we put together. And I'm also appreciative for people in this room who've emailed me, who've called me, and given ideas leveraging your private sector experience, how we can make government more efficient. So thank you for having me. I'm going to shut up now and uh, take as many uh, questions uh, as you'd like to shoot. Is there like a roving mic? Or? OK. I'll be running around with the mic, so if you got a question, I'll just pick you guys out. Start right here. If you could do it, give me your name and uh, where you live. Hello, I'm uh, Steve Pressman. I live in South Euclid. And the question is for you, Josh, is, you, of course, you're aware of uh, what's happening with the South Euclid Lindhurst Library. It's going to become the South Euclid Library, and Lindhurst won't have a library. And uh, there's basically the money for the libraries under the um, uh, Cuyahoga County Library System, and basically it's an appointed board and it's a creature of the state. We don't elect these people. And what's happening in South Euclid is they're going to, at the end of the day, they'll have spent $12.5 million on a library that South Euclid doesn't want and Lindhurst isn't going to have. Whereas the library system itself, they stayed in the old Telling Mansion where they've been for 55 years. They'll have, it'll only take them $5.4 million. And Josh, as you know, I was an engineer in the uh, Army Reserve and in facilities, and I can tell you. Steve, I can, give me your question, man. We got a lot of So the question yeah. is, uh, we could do it for $3 million. What can be done at the state level to control these out of control um, entities in Cuyahoga County? Uh, so we don't have to spend a whole bunch of money for a whole bunch of stuff that we don't need. All right, good question. So I believe in local control, and I don't think the state government should be telling uh, local school districts or local cities or counties how to spend and control their money. I think it's important for that message to not come from top down the state to local. I think it should come from bottom up from the people um, to, uh, to the local officials. So whether it's library officials, city officials, county officials, and we as citizens need to hold these folks accountable. I will tell you, however, Steve, that about a month ago at the University of Akron, I was giving a speech to probably 200 or so fiscal officers from local governments, uh, city treasurers, county treasurers, 
local library uh, fiscal officers, town, uh, township fiscal officers, I told them that when I do this transparency project, while we're starting with the state, I'm going to come to every one of them and ask them to give me their information. I'm going to go to the school board to the right here, the Brexel City Hall and the Brexel Broadway High School Board, and where you live in South Eagle, to the city council and the South Eagle Winter Schools, and throughout the state, we're going to go to mayors and city councils and school boards and superintendents and say, listen, we know you don't have the resources internally to manage the back end and the, the infrastructure of having your checkbook online. All you have to do is email us a file. You email us that file, we'll put it up online, we'll manage it. And for any of these school boards or city councils, mayors and superintendents that say no, it takes time to ask them why. And if you have a problem with having your spending information up online for the public to see, why don't you want it up there? And my hope is, Steve, that by having local information like libraries and others up on, online, it will, uh, it will help, uh, make them, force them to be more efficient. But listen, it's not the state's role to tell local governments how to operate. I think it's the people's role to uh, hold the local officials uh, accountable how they're spending money. Next question, Ray. Thanks. Hi, my name is Audrey Gallowin from North Royalton. And I was wondering if the state has begun to address the issue of Medicaid estate planning, and that is where people intentionally impoverish themselves so that they can leave their estate to their family and then go on Medicaid once they get into the nursing home. Because I'm going through that right now, and I think that if you have a million dollar estate, to impoverish yourself on paper in order to go on to Medicaid is something that I, I didn't know that was happening. And now, have you had any issues with that at the state level? I haven't. I haven't dealt a lot with uh, Medicaid fraud. I'll tell you who's been a leader on this, a guy named Dave Yost. Uh, Dave is a state auditor, and he's really been a, a leader when it comes to not only Medicaid fraud, but also uh, um, uh, fraud when it comes to the food stamps and uh, you know, that, 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 I think they're called EBT cards, I believe. I forget the, the name of the cards, but Dave's really been a leader as a state auditor on uh, sound the alarm and ringing the bell with people who are defrauding taxpayers in respect to Medicaid fraud and um, uh, right so the um, the follow-up kind of statement was that uh, you know it's not against the law and so perhaps there's a, 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 a needed legislative change to uh, you know to, to so the comment here is that it put, you know, she feels it puts seniors uh, seniors at risk yeah, yeah, next question Right here, sir. The name is Austin Allen here from Brexville. And one of my concerns is on the city, uh, county, and state uh, levels of double dipping. Uh, people working for the city, retiring, going to work for the state, coming back, going to work for the county. Uh, this happens all the time. Can we do anything about it? Uh, I'm a strong opponent of double dipping. I think we should uh, eliminate double dipping. I don't think it should be allowed, allowed in uh, the state law. Uh, you know, this is uh, a lot of the, um, yeah, there's a lot of different people who, you know, who do this in our state government. Uh, but again, this is a legislative change. You know, it needs a, a change in the law. I'm hopeful that, I know when the legislature engaged in uh, pension reform at the end of 2000, 12, I believe, either 11 or 12, I think it was 12, they, um, this was on the table, they talked about it, but it, it didn't pass, I'm not sure why, I don't know exactly how the debate went within the committees and within the legislative chambers, but um, I'm hopeful that within the next year or so that the legislature will eliminate double dipping because uh, I think it's unfair to taxpayers. Okay, we'll be right back here. Thank you. Um, Amy McDougall, I'm from Aurora. Um, I was part of the, the group that got petitions on the ballot so that we could reject Obamacare in Ohio. Um, cases. Cases seem to ignore the fact that two thirds of Americans don't want it and um, push for Medicaid expansion nevertheless. Um, I actually work for State Representative Matt Lynch who um, was part of rejecting Case's um, effort to, to um, expand Medicaid in Ohio. But I still hear rumors that it's going to come back regardless. And I was wondering what you know about that and how you feel about it. Uh, well, I, uh, 
earlier in the year penned a letter to the uh, state legislature um, uh, encouraging them to uh, reject the expansion of Medicaid here in the state of Ohio. Here are my concerns. Um, as CFO of the state, um, after the first three years, the uh, state of Ohio um, will be left holding back. And uh, this whole concept of quote unquote free money, it doesn't exist. It's taxpayer money. And there's, there's this thing as you know, free money from the federal government. Uh, secondly, uh, Medicaid, probably more than any other program, is ripe with uh, fraud and abuse. And like, you can't be expanding programs that are broken. Um, you should be fixing programs that are broken um, and, and, and reforming them, not uh, throwing more money at them. Um, third, uh, I have a concern that this will perpetuate a culture of dependence on governments. Uh, and that's the last thing we want to do. It's unfair to... It's unfair to to their credit made, uh, you know, made a good decision uh, and left it out of the state budget and I'm hopeful that they'll uh, continue to leave it uh, out, of the, out of the state budget. Um, one of the important parts uh, is kids and I think this is an important, you know, when you're having this discussion with your family and friends. Um, kids are already covered up to, I believe, 200% uh, of the poverty rate. So this would not help kids, this wouldn't impact kids. The kids are already covered. And uh, listen, I think it's, you know, unfair for a you know young to reject a young kid from his or her health care. You know, if, if, if a young kid is born into a you know a very unfortunate situation, you know, it's unfair to turn that person that that five year old kid away from health care. They're already covered. You know, they're already covered. What this will do is widen the net, and it'll include a bunch of people. Um, you know, it'll include it'll widen it to include you know, some people that I believe you know. It would have a negative impact um, because it would perpetuate for them a culture of dependence on government uh, instead of limiting the dependence uh, on, uh, on government. And so that's why that's why I forcefully, and strongly, and strongly um, oppose the uh, the expansion. My name is Michelle Leonetti from Copley, and this is a related question. If one has read the Affordable Health Care Act in 2016, they want to expand school clinics from uh, the Affordable Health Care Act to have clinics that are funded by the federal government with RNs in our schools. And I'm a school nurse, and right now we're one of the uh, states with the lowest ratio of RNs to students. It's about one RN for every 2,500 students. How do you think, if Obamacare stands, that's going to be implemented? What can we do to keep the government away from our kids? Right. As far as the first question, how it's going to be implemented, I have no idea. I, 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 I couldn't answer that. I, I, I have no idea. I, I don't think a lot of people in the federal government department of health and human services know. No, they don't know. We don't. I mean, I was actually with a guy a couple months ago who runs a. Uh, it's a company that outsources the human resource department for small businesses. So essentially, small businesses that don't have their own human resource department, they run it uh, outside of their business. I was asking him this, you know, not just on what you're asking, but general questions about the effect of Obamacare. He couldn't answer all of my questions. So if you have someone who specializes in human resources and benefits, who can't answer all those questions about Obamacare? Who, who can't? Um, you know, I, I saw um, that Mike Lee has a petition going on. I saw it on the internet today um, to uh, defund, defund Obamacare. and. Uh, Senator Rubio, Senator Lee, and others in Washington are, are talking about that, and uh, I think that's uh, wise. I think any way to stop it or slow it um, is, 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 is a good thing. Patty Gascoin-Telashek from Parma. Okay. Um, have you gotten any word or heard about anyone talking about tax holidays for either certain service sectors or uh, no sales tax for shoes the month before school opens. Other states do this, and um, I will be running for state representative next year. And I would love to have a tax holiday for all of us, just to um, spur the economy, give people a break, and everyone's happy. Win, win, win. Um, I do not know of any legislative proposals uh, in Columbus in regard to that. Where's uh, Representative Lynch's aid? 
do, do you know of anything uh, like that in Columbus being discussed in legislature? <laughs> okay, so I, I, I don't. Um, uh, but listen, that's why pick up the phone, email your legislators, and talk to them about it. Or just go ahead. Yeah, this is uh, Richard Bardelli, Eleven Brick School. Uh, I still sell long-term care. I know a lot about it. The basic thing is that we had developed a program of passport. You know what that is? Passport. I do know passport. Is, yes. Passport is one of this solving some of the problems of financial because my mother was on Medicaid, my sister was on Medicaid, and they had passport. They bring them in four hours a day. It works out beautiful if the person can take care of himself. My mother, fought, my mother and uh, sister lived together for 20 years. So when they came in to take care of it, it only cost about $11,000, as I understand, for passport, versus $60,000 they shoved them into a, a uh, nursing home. And this is a big expense strain on the Medicaid system. If we can expand that, I think Casey was talking about that, but well, we should expand that extensively because my mother, most people, they want to stay in their house before they have to get out of there. Okay? Um, hey, but before we uh, go on, I, I wanted to introduce someone who's here. Uh, this is uh, Justice Judy French. Um, Judy is a new, relatively new justice in the uh, in the Supreme Court, effective uh, January one. Um, let me just I'm going to pass the mic to her real quick. I didn't realize you were going to be here, but if you want to, um, you know, just give greetings from this high Supreme Court. <laughs> about Obamacare and throw out just one more issue. Obamacare was upheld by the U.S. Supreme Court by a majority of five unelected individual judges. I'm one of seven individual justices in Ohio, but the big difference is you elect us. So when we come to 2014 and you see judicial elections, whether for me and my colleagues on the Ohio Supreme Court or the judges in your local area, you have to pay attention to what those judges believe in. I'm a conservative judge, and I've got a record to prove it. So in 2014, I hope you'll support me and other conservative, philosophically conservative judges so we don't have those kinds of rulings that do not go a conservative way. Thank you to Josh. Just to remind you, this is a nonpartisan event, so if there are any other Supreme Court justices here, we will have <laughs> Democrat or Republican, they would have an opportunity to speak, and there's no, no politics here. All right. Who's, uh, where's the mic? Right here. Uh, Joe Sherry, Cleveland. Uh, your effort to put the expenses on the internet doesn't do much for me. I would rather see on the internet a listing of all Ohio's gross income, gross receipts, including any investment agencies that Ohio might have. What do you think? I think it's an interesting idea. Um, I, I'd have to talk to my staff about it to research the intricacies and you know how we can do that. I think the important thing, I think it's a good idea. Um, the important thing when you put this information on the internet, whatever it is, is given it in context. And so if you just throw up millions of rows of data on the web, it's, it's not really helpful to people. And so I think if we can get that information in a digestible, accessible way um, that provides context. I think it's a very good idea. Yeah, hi, Josh. Thanks for being here tonight. My name is Joe Patino from Southern Hills. I'm involved in the real estate industry, primarily foreclosures. I hear all this BS about things improving. What do you think about our state of Ohio as far as our economy is going and I keep preaching, we need more jobs here in Northeast Ohio to bring the value of our homes up, to get people earning more so they can afford these homes. All of us in this room have probably lost at least 30, 40% of our value of our homes after the past five, six years. What do you see for the future of the housing industry? Do you know anything about it? So I, as far as Northeast Ohio goes, it's a aging population. And 
Um, true story with me, I don't see the values of Northeast Ohio homes um, skyrocketing any time uh, in, the, in, the, in, the near, in the near future. You know, just being straight with you. Um, I do agree with you, though, that the premise is if there's more jobs here, if the economy's doing well, then there will be higher home values, uh, most likely. And so it begs the question, you know, how can we create a better environment for economic growth? Part of it's tax policy, what we, we've talked about. You know, when you look throughout the country uh, and you see states that have lower income taxes or no state income tax and uh, have a more friendly and simple tax code, by and large, oftentimes you see more people and more businesses moving there. Um, also, uh, when it comes to the regulatory environment, if a small business knows that it takes six months to get a permit in Ohio, so a permit, but one month in another state, that might be the difference between staying here and moving, uh, and moving, some, moving somewhere else. Uh, something else uh, I feel very strongly about is getting back to the basics uh, when it comes to uh, blue collar jobs. And I think we need to put shop class back in high schools. Remember the show Cheers? So there's this guy on Cheers who uh, played Cliff the Mailman. His name was uh, John Rossiger. All right, good guy. Sort of become friendly with him over the years. So after being on Cheers, he goes uh, and he becomes the, the voice of the Pixar movies. And I think that's where he really became successful uh, financially, at least, uh, is the voice of the Pixar movies. And I think he still, still does a lot of those movies. And so he wants to get active charitably and give away some of his uh, money that he's earned. He goes back to his hometown, about, I think it was Bridgeport, Connecticut, and he sees that this place has been economically decimated, and he starts asking around why. And one of the answers he gets back is, well, we ran out of well-trained workers, uh, and a lot of the companies left. There were other, other things that played, but that was one of the reasons. And rather than his charity of choice being um, you know, a lot of the organizations, we know that great organizations like the Heart Association or Lugger Association, United Way, what have you. He starts this organization to bring profile to blue collar men and women, to inject pride in people who go into those types of jobs. And then he starts a TV show and travels the country, it's called Made in America, bringing profile to men and women who are working in these jobs. Let me tell you something, right now in Germany, they don't call machinists machinists, they call them engineers. It's one of the most prestigious jobs you can have. I think we did not only put shop class back in high schools, part of it's injecting pride in the young people, saying, listen, if you want to go pursue a four-year bachelor's degree at Ohio State or Cleveland State or Harvard, you should have that opportunity, you should pursue your dreams, a master's degree, a PhD, a law degree, a medical degree. But at the same time, if you enjoy working on your family car or tractor, or you like taking apart the lawnmower at your house and putting it back together, or being a technician and working with computers, what have you, not only is there nothing wrong with it, but that's the backbone of America. You know, as as, as as fortunate as we are to have great service companies in Ohio, you know, Progressive Insurance and Nationwide Insurance and Key Bank and Huntington Bank and Fifth Third Bank and a lot of these other service type oriented companies and all these great law firms and accounting firms throughout the, oh, Cleveland and the, and, the, and the state. At the end of the day, if we're going to be strong as a state. If we're going to be strong as a country, we got to make things. In order to make things, we have to have that well-trained, qualified workforce. There's a huge shortage of welders right now in America, in Ohio and America. About an hour and a half southeast of here in the Utica and the Marcellus Shale, where they're drilling for a lot of uh, oil and gas, they're shipping 25-year-olds from Texas and Oklahoma because they can't find enough trained workers in these disciplines. I hear it time and time again. Uh, and uh, you know, it's something that you know we, as not just elected leaders, but you talking to your kids and grandkids, talking to your coworkers, we have to inject, re-inject pride to young people in working these blue collar jobs. And I think part of the problem is young people think that these manufacturing jobs are these dirty manufacturing jobs that might have existed in the earlier part of last century. But right now, when I go and tour manufacturing companies. Talking about you can eat off the floor oftentimes. High tech, advanced manufacturing, and uh, you know a lot of these men and women I meet in these on the floor of these plants, they're operating pretty uh, high speed, expensive uh, technology, and uh, we.
we just need to do a better job as a country of communicating that uh, to these uh, to these young people. Because you've you got a whole generation of young people who have four-year liberal arts degrees, hundred thousand dollars in debt, and they're serving coffee in Starbucks or working retail at the mall, and uh, it's, it's it's been a disservice to those people. Okay, we're sorry, trying to, we're trying to get on a soapbox there. On the Would it be your office or David Yule's office that could put out how expensive this would really be for Ohioans? And also, we don't have an honest broker in the White House. He could just decide to waive giving us the tax money back, and we'll be on our own, because he's proven that the law doesn't matter to him. Right, so there's a lot of uh, nonprofit organizations throughout the state of Ohio that have put out good information uh, in, respect to, uh, uh, in respect to the uh, expansion. Uh, the you know the organization that you know, the name behind me on the uh, on the sign there. I mean they're doing uh, a lot of the public policy work, uh, not just here in Ohio but nationally uh, in respect to this uh, Medicaid uh, expansion. Uh, the Buckeye Institute, which is a conservative think tank uh, in uh, in Columbus. Um, I mean if you want, uh, we you can connect with me or one of the people who works with me, and we can give you some of these resources of uh, a lot of the public policy work that's been done by. Nonprofit, nonpartisan think tank, think tank type organizations that have really uh, put the, the time into uh, researching this. Because it's not like the fight in Ohio is unique. You know, this the same thing's going on in Ohio is you know going on in states uh, throughout the country. Bobby Jindal, governor of Louisiana, wrote a great uh, piece on this. I forget what the publication was, but it was probably a month or two ago. You could just Google it and find it. He wrote a great piece on why he, as governor, uh, decided to uh, oppose the expansion of Medicaid. 